Good evening. On behalf of Banco Sabadell, I would like to welcome Professor Horacio Atanasio and express my sincere thanks to him for accepting to take part in the 30th edition of, of the Barcelona Graduate School Lecture Series. I would also like to extend a warm welcome to both the students and members of the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics, as well as other participants in what promises to be a stimulating exchange of ideas. Professor Horacio Atanasio is Jeremy Bentham Professor of Economics at University College London and co-director of the Center for the Evaluation of Development Policies at the Institute for Fiscal Studies in the United Kingdom. He has an incredibly long and impressive CV, but luckily for me, the job of reducing it to a couple of minutes rests with Professor Alessandro Tarot. I'm sure that our speaker will bring valuable insights into today's topic, which is human capital formation during the early years. The topic is complex, given the, la the large number and sensitive nature of some of the intervening factors and crucial to any debate on development, inequality, and equal opportunity. Professor Atanasio's work puts him in a privileged position to shed light on this issue from both an academic and an applied policy point of view. I'm sure we all will enjoy this special evening. Now over to Professor Tarozzi. The floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do everything in two minutes, but maybe in five. So uh, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. It's a real pleasure uh, for me to introduce Horatio uh, to this audience. Uh, Horatio, um, we already know now, uh, is Jeremy Bentham Professor of Economics at UCL, and he, uh, I learned recently that he's also having a lot of, uh, lot of fun being the chair of the department. Uh, Ian, uh, our colleague Ian, that uh, is our own chair, because he has a joint appointment, so he was joking today that maybe because, uh, because Horatio is Ian's chair also, then maybe Horatio is also our chair at UPF, but I don't know whether that's uh, completely true. So Horatio, uh, he earns his PhD uh, at the London School of Economics in 1988, and since then he has the, a long and distinguished career. Uh, he started his uh, career uh, uh, as an academic in uh, Stanford University. Then he spent a couple of years in Bologna. I'm going to uh, return to, to this uh, for a minute later on before moving to, to, the, uh, to uh, University College. Um, uh, Horatio has been playing a leading role for almost 20 years at the Institute for Fiscal Studies in London, and he has been for more than 10 years the director of the Center for the Evaluation of Development Policies, uh, EDIPO, at IF, uh, IFS and UCL. Um, Horatio has been a fellow and, and he is a, a fellow of countless prestigious professional organizations, including the Econometric Society, the Royal Economic Society, the Bureau for Research in Economic Analysis uh, of Development, what we call BRED, the MBR, CPR, the British, the British Academy, the European Economic Association, and he is actually currently uh, the president of the European Economic Association starting this year. Uh, he has also been the managing editor of a number of really presti of, uh, of prestigious uh, reviews, the Review Economic Studies, the Journal of European Economic Association, and uh, Quantitative Economics uh, very recently. In terms of scientific contributions, uh, he, uh, Orazio, uh, as I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody knows in this room, has a very, very long CV. Uh, his CV lists uh, something like almost 100 peer-reviewed publications with uh, something like 10,000 Google Scholar citations. And many of these are seminal contributions. I'm pretty sure that everyone in this room has read uh, a number of his papers. Um, he has written especially, but not limited, to uh, uh, topics related to the theory and empirics of household consumption, savings, labor supply behavior, risk sharing both within, ha within the household and across different households. And more recently, he has been involved very heavily in uh, uh, the study of early life interventions and their importance for human capital accumulation. That's going to be the topic of, uh, of today's presentation. Now, I, I hope you don't mind if I abuse a little bit my position and I conclude with uh, something like a, a little bit of a quick personal note. I mentioned earlier that uh, before uh, moving from Stanford to London, or I had to spend a couple of uh, years at Università di Bologna uh, in Italy where, well, by the way, he also studied uh, as an undergraduate. Now, I, I'm not sure that this uh, short spell in Bologna left uh, him, uh, uh, to him, a lot of good memories, but uh, uh, good memories certainly uh, he did leave to a number of students uh, that took his courses. And this is certainly true for myself, 
and for Barbara Rossi, who's, uh, who's there, and she's my, as uh, some people know, my, my favorite colleague here at UPF, uh, looking, <laughs> looking very embarrassed right now. Uh, so I remember Oratio's course, uh, Oratio's course very well because uh, uh, he was uh, somewhat responsible for making uh, some of the later course a little bit boring because uh, um, uh, most of what we saw later was already being covered often in, uh, you know, with more depth by, by Oratio. So uh, th that was quite remarkable. Now, uh, I've said a lot of great things about him, but so I, I, I don't want you uh, to, to, to leave uh, tonight with the impression that uh, he, he doesn't make mistakes, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to conclude with, uh, with, a, with, a, uh, big, with a very serious error, error of judgment on his part, which was you know, to write a letter of recommendation for me when I applied to grad school, and I, I think it actually was a good letter because I was admitted to a good program. So. Uh, seriously, uh, Oratio was, was a very, very important person for me when I started my quest for a PhD in economics, and he was one of, uh, like I said, one of my and Barbara's uh, letter writers when we applied to grad school, <clears throat> and so he really was the key person that pushed us to uh, get, out of, uh, get out of Italy and try the uh, US adventure. So he was the one who pushed us. To, oh, maybe I should say that he pushed Barbara and then Barbara dragged me. So you know, by transitivity, he also pushed me. Uh, so you know, it, there's nothing remarkable in a sense about writing letters. You know, my, 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 pretty much every, every faculty in this room does it. But the, what, what I think is, is somewhat remarkable is the fact that back then in Bologna, it was not common at all to go uh, on this uh, you know, US adventure. So uh, having had the opportunity to, to meet Orazio during his uh, short spell there was really very, very important. So I hope you'll forgive me for you know, sneaking this personal note into this, but uh, I would like to take this opportunity to really thank you, Orazio, for everything you did for us, because I, I'm really sure that our, life, uh, our lives would have been quite different uh, without your support and encouragement. And of course, you know, I know that uh, there are many other people out there in the profession that could say the same. So thanks a lot. And uh, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here in Barcelona again. Uh, it's, I was uh, saying earlier that it's one of my favorite cities, so it's always nice. Um, to, uh, to, to be back here. Uh, the only regret is that this, uh, this time is a very short visit, unfortunately, but uh, I need to go back to London tomorrow. So today I'm going to talk about the, uh, uh, something that has become quite important for my research and for my personal interest in my life in general, which is the determinants of human capital formation during the early years of life. And I will uh, talk about theory, about measurement, about empirics, about policies, uh, with a special reference to, um, um, to developing countries. I will use uh, uh, quite liberally material from studies and, and that I've done over the last uh, seven or eight years with, uh, with several co-authors. Uh, this is some of the papers on which I will draw upon. The one in blue are the one that I will actually literally take results from and show some numbers or some equations from those papers. Uh, the, the one not in blue <coughs> are papers that are very much related to <coughs> to this work, but uh, but I won't have the time to to, uh, to cover in, in any uh, in any way. Um, so you can see there is there is lots of stuff uh, lots of stuff there, and so I would better move on. I should also acknowledge a number of intellectual depths, uh, and I would I group them in three in three uh, groups uh, related to a few people. The first one is uh, my interest in uh, in child development uh, that was stimulated from reading a paper which I will uh, cite and show a picture from by Sally Grantham McGregor and co-authors that was published in The Lancet in 1991. Is This is a Jamaica study. And since then, I got to know uh, Sally quite well and work with her. She's uh, participated with us in some of the work we've been doing in Colombia and in India. Uh, and she's been very, very influential in, um, in, in shaping what I think about these issues. Of course, then, uh, the work of Jim Heckman and co-authors on, on these issues is, is very much present uh, in, in what I will be saying, and I've been interacting with Jim quite a bit. In the, in the recent years. And finally, uh, when I will talk towards the end of, uh, about measurement and where the work we've been doing on measurement and trying to go beyond reveal preferences in, in, uh, in measuring uh, individual variables and um, things, uh, uh, you know, the stuff that Chuck Mansky has been doing on um, uh, subjective expectation, uh, I think, is quite important. And also, I'd like to mention Tom Juster, who was one of the uh, founders of the PSID, and in the 60s and 70s, he did really s seminal work on eliciting um, 
individual preferences and individual beliefs and expectation. And uh, I wish this work was, uh, was recognized more, and that I'll try to get back to that. So this is what I, uh, I will, uh, uh, in my talk will look like. I will start with an introduction on the importance of early years. I'll try to keep this uh, thing short, partly because I've been reading quite a bit on this, and, and this spiel at the beginning has become almost boring. Everybody now is saying that early years are important. Uh, then I will talk about uh, what I think we know and what we do not know yet in these fields. I, when I started working, I was amazed by the, how much we still don't know on, on various dimensions. Then I will try to uh, propose a simple theoretical frameworks, which I think can be very useful to shape our discourse in, in, in this field. <laughs> And, uh, and also the discussion of policies. Uh, then I will uh, talk about the uh, using this, uh, uh, give an example of a, a specific use of this uh, theoretical framework uh, to interpret the results of, uh, of uh, an impact evaluation of a specific intervention. This is an intervention which we actually designed and implemented uh, evaluated and then uh, we tried to, to use the, these numbers to try to understand what is behind this, uh, what are the mechanisms behind the impacts that we observe. And that is a good point to make two short digressions. One on the use, uh, uh, this is a big debate in, uh, in economics and in, in development economics in particular uh, about the alternative or complementary use in, uh, of uh, structural models and randomized control trials. So I will say a few things about that. And what does become my um, uh, almost my obsession these days, which is measurement. And so I will try to say a few things about, about measurement. And finally, uh, in the last section, which is the, the most uh, novel, uh, the most recent uh, work that we've been doing, is on, uh, on beliefs and the importance that beliefs and attitudes have, that, uh, have on individual choices. And what, how can we go about avoiding making uh, very strong assumptions about rationality and trying to use a, a, a variety of methods to, um, to, um, to estimate uh, what people think about production functions, about rates of returns on certain investments, and how can we el either elicit or estimate uh, from, uh, from uh, empirical uh, work. So I, I'll, uh, and then I will conclude. So as I mentioned, there is a considerable amount of uh, attention that has been uh, uh, devoted to uh, human capital development in the early years. Um, it, uh, you know, human capital is perceived to be important in, the, in growth and development. It's probably, it's, it's some, some people see it as an effective way of reducing inequality and increasing equity of opportunity. Human capital is a very complex process. Uh, human capital is probably a, a multidimensional object. If you think of a production function, there are probably several factors of production that enter that we are used to call with an age. Probably that age should be a vector where different skills are, uh, uh, play different roles in the production function and therefore are pay, pay different prices and get different remunerations in the labor market. This the multidimensionality also ha is important in terms of the accumulation of human capital in the sense that uh, these different dimensions of human capital, I'm thinking, for instance, of cognitive skills, social emotional skills, but also uh, physical skills like uh, health, can, uh, can play, uh, not only can play different roles in the production function, but they can also play different roles in the accumulation itself of, of, of skills over the, over the uh, life cycle. We also know that uh, uh, accumulation of human capital starts very early in life, probably before birth. We also know that early years are important because uh, they are, um, there is a overwhelming evidence that they have very long-run consequences. If you run early regressions and, pu uh, and put birth weight on the right-hand side, you will find very significant, uh, significant effects, even after controlling for a variety of, of other variables that are more recent to, the, to your observation. But not only that, uh, maybe uh, because of uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, early years can be so vulnerable, children can be so vulnerable, they also can be very malleable. And therefore, uh, that, makes, uh, that very observation makes uh, early years extremely salient and important for the design of, of policies. Uh, 
Now, it doesn't mean that everything is settled that, uh, past the age of three. Of course, there are a number of, uh, especially for, for socio-emotional skills, a um, uh, number of uh, interventions that have been proven to be effective on, on older children. And, but, but definitely, uh, the early years are very important. After all, I do have a teenager boy, so I, I hope that uh, something can be done um, during those years. Um, <clears throat> Now, children vulnerability and policy interventions can be particularly relevant in developing countries because of the risk factors that affect um, uh, uh, the, the children living in those, in those countries. The Lancet series in, uh, in 2007 identified, estimated uh, 200 million children that are at risk of not developing their full potential because of, of, of poverty uh, uh, and the conditions in which, uh, in which they grow. And that map shows where these children uh, are. Um, there are lots of factors that run uh, from biological factors, nutrition, under nutrition in a perinatal grow, uh, period and early childhood, iron deficiency. In general, micronutrients deficiency can be very important. The presence of uh, infectious diseases, environmental factors like clean water, hygiene, and, uh, and psycho psychosocial factors like the lack of proper stimulation, um, violence, maternal depression, and so on and so forth. And these things can be staggering. This is a picture taken from a, a paper by uh, Chris Paxson and Norbert Shadi, uh, published in the Journal of Human Resources. These are, these are data from Ecuador. And these are children, uh, um, they follow their uh, language development from age 36. I'll, I'll be thinking in months, uh, just to make clear. So uh, throughout the talks, uh, um, when I say an age is in months, so th th 36 months to se 70 months. Um, and um, I, w they follow their language development. These are internally standardized. And then they divide the children according to their socioeconomic background, basically wealth. And so uh, they are pl plotted the first uh, decile, the second, third, and fourth decile. Fourth decile, not, this, the top of the uh, wealth distribution is just not in that graph. And what you can see that uh, while uh, already at the age 36, there are some differences. These differences become dramatic by age six years, by age uh, 72. And those are, those are huge. Those are three standard deviations of, of a standardized score. Three standard deviations. That means in terms of, uh, of uh, developmental delays is a two and a half, in language, is a two and a half year delay. So you take a kid who is six, and he will have the language of a three-year-old, three-and-a-half-year-old. You send that kid to school. They will teach him according to the curriculum. That kid is not going to learn anything. And those delays will accumulate over time. So those, uh, those differences are dramatic. And, and that's something that uh, should, should be. And you'll find them everywhere. These are data from Bangladesh. Uh, these are all poor kids, the one in this. Uh, these are from a paper that I just was just published in pediatrics and, uh, and they show two things that one is that the um, uh, these delays are, appear very very early so they are already statistically significant in terms of IQ these are all IQ measures at seven months and they become larger and larger uh, 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 as the as the children uh, uh, grow these are data from Colombia Again, you'll find the uh, emergence of significant difference in cognitive language and, and uh, socio-emotional development at age 12 months, and they will uh, grow up to the age of three or four. So the, um, that's dramatic, and that's uh, scary in a way. Uh, then on a more optimistic note, uh, there is now more and more evidence about some interventions that have been uh, uh, successful in changing um, uh, uh, children's future in a way. Um, 
And this has been shown both in developed and developing countries. These are some programs in the US that have received quite a bit of attention. Uh, the ferry is the ferry preschool program. Um, the second is the abecedary and the nurse family partnership. Um, just to give you an example, the, the, both the Perry and the abecedary are particularly impressive because these children, these were programs that were done in the 60s and 70s. So the Perry was done in the town of Ypsilanti, Michigan in the late 60s. So these, kid, these kids have been, follow, have been followed for 40 years and they've shown the impacts on any possible, uh, any possible variable you can look at from earnings to probability of uh, finishing high school to probability of cr uh, committing crime and so on and so forth. In the case of the abecedary, and this was a program in uh, North Carolina that was done in the early 70s, uh, these kids again were followed uh, uh, for a number of times. Uh, Jim Heckman and a number of co-authors have just published a paper in Science that show the impacts on, on the health of these children. So they are much less uh, likely to be obese, they are much less likely to, to have high blood pressure, uh, and so on and so forth. And so these were interventions that were done during the early years, three to five, and, and yet had uh, an impact uh, 40 years later. But the one I want to talk about, uh, uh, there have been uh, stuff in, in, in um, developing countries. The one I want to talk, uh, talk a little bit about is ja the Jamaica study, partly because uh, uh, for me has been uh, important. I, it really uh, had a big impact on me and in, 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 uh, induced me to, to want to work in, the, in, in this field. So what Sally Grant and McGregor did in the, in the late 70s, early 80s in, uh, in Kingston, Jamaica, she identified 129 children, divided them randomly in four groups. One, she designed this uh, stimulation program. The stimulation program is um, uh, hourly visits, uh, uh, once a week, where a, a visitor goes and, and does a number of activities with the mother. I'll come back to that in a second. Then there is a nutrition group, a group that receives both of them, and, uh, and then a control group. Again, this uh, study is amazing because these children were followed over time. The intervention was started when the children were between uh, 9 and 24 months and lasted for two years. But then the children were followed uh, for, for uh, many years, um, uh, up to um, last year. There was a, a, tw the, a few years ago, there was a 22 years follow-up. So these are the impacts of the, of the intervention um, at the end of the intervention itself. So the four groups were the same. These are the guys that receive both supplementation and stimulation. These are the stimulated children. These are the supplemented children, food. And these are the control group. You can, these are non-stunted children. You can see that w those that receive both of them, by the end of it, they almost caught up with, uh, with the, uh, with the um, uh, children that were not stunted at the, at the beginning. But the one really impressive one is the long run. So the, in the long run, uh, the, um, the nutrition intervention completely fades away, the effect of that intervention, but the stimulation stays on. So the, the red are stimulated children, the blue are non-stimulated children. The light blue are the non-stunted ones that were out, kind of outside the study altogether. And so it's, it's true the impact is huge by the end of the intervention and fades away a little bit, but it's still significant even 15 years after the end of the intervention. And then when you look at the earnings, 22 years later, you find the impacts on earnings. You find the effect on employment. So a two years intervention that has impacts in the very long run. Yes, they are expensive, but uh, they are definitely worth their money. So what, we, what do we know and what we don't know in this field? So I think over the last few decades, we have learned quite a bit. I already talked about the multidimensionality of human capital. We know that early years are important. We know that nutrition is important. We know that stimulation is key uh, to child development. It probably is, is even more effective than nutrition itself. And we can talk a little bit about that. Um, we know that household environment stimulation is extremely uh, important, especially in the very first few years of life. And we know that there are these dynamic interactions that, uh, that, that they play, they may play an important role. However, there is a huge amount that we don't know. And uh, the way I characterize is that three categories of things that we don't know. We still do not understand the biological mechanisms through which um, cognitive and non-cognitive development uh, occurs through, through the very early years. Um, and that's something that really surprised me. 
you know, if you want to know, for instance, what's the effect of, uh, uh, on a child um, uh, cognitive development, say, at age six, of being anemic at age two, okay? Well, there is no answer to that question. There is no very strong evidence. Some people will say, yeah, that's a huge effect. Other people say no. Um, and and we, literally, we do not know, partly because we do not understand the, um, <clears throat> the mechanism through which this, this happened. And it's a strong implication for, for policies. For instance, uh, if I have an anemic child, say in Tanzania, should I give him uh, uh, iron supplements or not? Well, when I, when I first thought, I said, yeah, of course, that's a good idea. Well, not necessarily. That uh, I uh, mentioned Tanzania because there has recently been a study where uh, was a pilot, a randomized control uh, trial of uh, uh, of uh, supplement giving iron supplements to children. It was stopped because you realized that you actually might be killing those kids because uh, the iron might be in in area with endemic malaria. You might be uh, feeding the parasite rather than uh, uh, helping the children. So there are lots of stuff we don't know, and surprisingly how much we don't know. Not to mention the genetics. So well, today I was talking about, uh, about this with Nancy a little bit. The, there's some really interesting work uh, that I do not have time to go into on the role of both the genetics and epigenetics in this, uh, and, and still lots of stuff that is not known. The second thing is that uh, we don't understand the interactions between, so nutrition and stimulations that seem to be in, interacting in the previous graphs, but then they disappear. So how do, they, how do these things work? Not to mention the dynamics. The data is very sparse on this, and so there's much to, to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to be learned about this. So the, se so the first is, is literally the production function, and, per uh, and excuse me, the use of uh, economic jargon. We don't fully understand the shape or the parameters of the, of the production function. The second thing is that um, we don't fully understand what parents do. Um, what, what are the constraints that they face? Is it resources? Is it information? Is it attitudes, beliefs? Um, you know, as an economist, I used to think that the resources was the most important thing. I'm not quite sure anymore, and I'll be going back to, to that. Um, there are some really interesting books that I will probably be citing later on, like Meaningful Differences by two sociologists that measured the number of words that the middle class e uh, children hear relative to the number of words that poor kids hear. Or there is a great book by an anthropologist called Annette Laroe called Unequal Childhoods, which again focuses more on, on attitudes towards parenting in different uh, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. And then, of course, the big one is the, what happens within the family. What are the roles played by mothers and fathers, and how do they decide about things? And the final thing, the final third big area is that, okay, we know that the Jamaica intervention uh, worked, but, uh, but um, how did it work? And, and especially, how can, can this thing be scaled up? How, what does it take to, to scale things up? And I think that's, that's a, 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 you know, what doctors call the distinction between effectiveness and, and efficacy of, uh, of interventions. That's a, that's a big unknown. And I'll come back to that too. So let me talk a little bit about my uh, theoretical framework, which is uh, uh, in part taken from uh, the uh, Cunha Heckman Shenak Econometrica paper 2010. So we have a production function where, uh, where the human capital <coughs> at time t plus one, or the age t plus one, depends on the human capital t, depends on background variables and investment and, um, and some shocks that, um, that the parents um, observe. Uh, the, and the shape uh, is quite, it can be changed over, uh, changing over time. So the, the, this can be a fairly flexible uh, structure. All these are, all, all these are um, vectors. So for instance, in human capital, we can, in this example, I have a cognitive uh, a component, uh, a socio-emotional component, and a health component. And analogously, we have uh, some mother, father, and other uh, regional uh, background variables, which could be time varying or not. And then they have uh, investment in, say, material or time. <clears throat> And so what, uh, what parents do is to maximize some objective function, 
and they have a budget constraint, so that's the cost of investment. And the alternative, they can consume stuff. And then they have this uh, production function, or at least the perception of a production function, what they think uh, they're doing when they invest, okay? <clears throat> um, now, this is a static model. I could make it, uh, I could make it uh, dynamic, and in, in some situations, it's interesting to do the dynamics, but, uh, but not for what I want to say today. So the, well, one issue that we need to face is that many of the variables that are in this model are not observed. And in fact, um, uh, you know, th we, we will work uh, following the uh, Cunha et al. Uh, paper, assuming that none of that stuff is observed. So we have a conceptual framework where there are these factors, you know, cognitive factors and, and social-emotional factors and health factors, but really we don't observe any of them. Instead, what we do is we observe some measures that are related to them. So we have a measurement system here where you observe these M's, these indicators, that are driven by, uh, by the factors, by the observed factors, uh, with some loading factors, but they are corrupt by measurement error. Okay? And so this, uh, I found this, uh, this structure where you have a, a clear um, theoretical framework with some, uh, some concepts that enter and that we can make sense of. And then in parallel, we have uh, this measurement system. So measurement has got the direct role to play. Um, and this becomes particularly important when you are in the business of actually running, um, measuring things, because then I will be telling you about a few theorems about identification, which will require, require some assumption of the measurement. And then, it be, you know, if you're, if you're in the business of writing your own questionnaires and devising your own measurements, you can make sure that you do it in a way which is consistent with the assumptions you need to get identification. So, the, you know, this is the, the Kotlarski theorems that this, uh, if you have at least two measurements on it for each factor, then you can identify non-parametrically uh, the distribution uh, of both the factors and the, uh, and the measurement errors. Um, we'll need some normalization on one of the loading factors, but otherwise everything is identified. So you need at least, the conditions is the, you, you need uh, at least two, um, observe a uh, two measurement for each factor, and you need the, uh, to assume that the uh, measurement error is independent across those observations. So effectively, the intuition is that I do not observe what I'm interested in. I have several measures of this, is, uh, and so to, to identify the distribution of what I'm interested in, I need the measurement error to average out over many observations. That's why I need at least two, uh, two uh, uh, measurement with, uh, with uh, independent measurement error. Some of these assumptions can be relaxed, but that's, that's the basic intuition. Now, the second issue from an econometric point of view is the fact that, uh, you know, when I wrote down that production function, uh, some of the elements on the right-hand side are investment, and the investment are choices that are made by the parents, and they react to shock, so they, to shocks. So they, if they observe that the child is doing not very well, uh, because has been affected by some sort of problems, they could react in their investment. And they can go both ways. There is a, a literature on whether parents uh, tend to compensate shocks uh, or uh, reinforce shocks. So they, you know, they, the child receives a negative shock, is doing really badly, they can just give up on their child and say, this guy is hopeless. Or, or, or the opposite. It could be that, oh, this kid has been affected by this. I, I really need to put an effort in, uh, in, in remediate uh, this situation. And the problem, of course, is that uh, uh, there is a correlation that, uh, from the investment choices and the shocks, and that makes uh, identification of the production function dif difficult. So the way to go about it is to be explicit about what parents do and derive a, 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 an investment function. <coughs> you can then estimate the investment function together with the production function uh, or approximate it and use then a control function approach. The idea is that for identification now you need some variables that determine investment but do not enter directly the production function. And so this could be things like prices. So if you, uh, 
or some family resources that that you know uh, affect the the, uh, the the ability of parents to do certain things, but do not have a direct impact. I personally usually prefer prices. So, you, but you need you need very because it's easier to assume that they are uh, the families are price takers, uh, but but you need that assumption. And that's what I was saying here. Now the parameters of the investment function will depend on the parameters of the utility function and the parameters of the production functions as perceived by the parents. So the parents decide how much to invest into this child, depends how much I love the child, related to going to buy a beer, and, uh, and what I think my investment is gonna do to the child. So those are the two things that determine the investment. And I put it there because, uh, because I'll go back to these this issues here. So we've done this uh, estimation. We have extended some of the stuff that Heckman and Carter have done. There is a paper being written with uh, Costas McGill and Emily Nix, who's at Yale. Who's at Yale. Um, I won't go into these technical details, but the, the econometrics is quite neat uh, because you first effectively do the estimation of the measurement system. Once you know the distribution of these factors, you just take draws from that distribution, and then you can estimate the production function or the investment function in a fairly straightforward way, just doing nonlinear GLS uh, sort of things. So let's see how we use this model. So um, what we did was to, um, uh, to, to um, uh, construct a randomized control trial, and I will briefly describe the, uh, to evaluate an intervention, which I will br briefly describe and tell you about the, the, the impacts. Then I will show how we use the data from the intervention to estimate the production function. Now, what's the point of doing this production function stuff? The point is that um, if I'm only interested in the impacts, then I can just compare the means. So I compare the treated kids to the non-treated kids. And that's the impact of the intervention. Think for policy design, what you want to know, however, is how this intervention, if you do have an impact, is how this intervention is having an impact. And putting everything within the framework of the production function and the investment function allows you to say something, and, and we'll see how this is done. So these are results from a paper that has just been published in the Brit uh, British Medical Journal. So all my recent publications are in, in medicine journals, but I'm going back to economics journal as well. Um, so the intervention was uh, is very similar to the Jamaica uh, one. We did it in collaboration with uh, with Sally. Uh, we adapted the we translated to Colombian uh, the, um, uh, the the intervention, uh, the Jamaican one, and we're a one hour weekly visits by a visitor who interacts with the mother and the child and develops an integrated and well-structured curriculum. Focuses on cognition, language, and fine motor skills. So what, I, what is new relative to the Jamaica? Uh, apart from the translation into, into uh, Colombian, uh, the, 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 one of the big innovation is the fact that we try to do something that is scalable. And by that I, know I don't mean just cheap, although that is an important aspect of it. Um, so rather than sending a visitor who is a, a health uh, or a social worker uh, to do these weekly visits and, and, and develop this curriculum, we, send, uh, we, we train and hire local women. So these are the local representatives of the beneficiaries of a, well, a large welfare program. And I think that's important for two reasons. First of all is the fact that we're using the infrastructure of a large program which exists all over the country so, and so it's scalable in that sense, that infrastructure already exists. There is a second uh, sense in which uh, this is important for scalability. What we're trying to do with this intervention is to change behavior. Changing behavior is difficult. If you've read a little bit of the literature on um, sanitation or washing hands, there have been dozens and dozens of interventions that have absolutely no impact on, uh, on, those, on those outcomes. Poor people occasionally do very silly things um, and um, for a variety of reasons. And, and they receive um, lots of messages. And they really do not have a way to discriminate between good messages and, and bad messages. So there are poli politicians and policymakers and quacks and academics and, 
and all sorts of people that tell them to do stuff differently. So I think the fact that we use local women to channel the, the messages that we think are important, uh, it, it could be quite important for the, effect, uh, for the effectiveness of the, of the intervention. The other big difference is that uh, we collect uh, a boatload of data. So we have data on, on lots and lots of stuff. Uh, so, so that allows us to do this, this, uh, uh, this work uh, which goes beyond the simple comparisons of means. So we do a cluster randomized control trial. We run these things in 96 towns in, uh, in uh, three regions in Colombia. So this is a, uh, this is a large trial, um, just to boast a little bit. The, 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 the area is quite large. It's three, three times the size of England, these three regions. Uh, our sample is 96 towns, about 1,400 children. If you think that the Perry was 123 children, uh, the uh, Abyssidarium was 111 children, uh, Jamaica was 129 children. So we're, we're quite a bit larger. It's true that in terms of uh, statistical power, uh, what counts is the, 90, is the number of clusters, but the intercluster correlation in our sample is relatively small, so it's 0.04 for most of the outcomes we're interested in. So effectively, we have a, an effective sample size of about 880, which is, which is much, much larger than any existing study of this nature. So this, uh, this is a table from my paper in the BMJ, in our paper in the BMJ. Uh, so this is the impact of the stimulation branch of the intervention. And so we, um, we use this thing called the Bailey's, uh, Bailey's uh, scores um, of uh, infant development. Uh, there are different scales. There is a cognition scale. There is uh, uh, two types of languages, receptive and expressive language. Three years ago, I didn't know what was the difference between receptive and expressive language. So uh, for those of you who don't, uh, receptive uh, is when pe kids understand words and expressive is one, one of the say. So receptive comes first and expressive comes later. So you first learn the meaning of the word and then you say it. At least most people do. Uh, the, um, so we got an impact uh, on cognition and on receptive language. We don't get much of an impact of, uh, on reception of fine motor skills. Now, uh, this, uh, this, um, uh, this is uh, effects are measured. These are the raw scores, which don't mean much to you. But these are in, uh, expressed in fraction of standard deviations of the Z-score. So it's 0.26 of a standard deviation of Z-score for, uh, for um, co 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 cognition and uh, 0.22 of a Z score for, uh, for language. Is that big? Is that small? Well, uh, that, just to put things into a context, the, um, these two uh, lines, this one and that one, are from a different study we did in, in Bogota. So these are kids in the bottom <coughs> uh, quartile of the wealth distribution in Bogota, and these are kids in the top quartile. So, uh, and these are again uh, cognition scales uh, uh, standardized by age. So these are flat lines. And so you can see that there is this big uh, difference uh, starting at age 28 up to age 42. Okay? So that we knew already. There are this big socioeconomic difference. Now the children in our rural sample, the 96 sounds, the control one are the reg, uh, are the reg kids. So they're very similar. So th th those are the kids in the slums in Bogota. If, for those of you who know Bogota, these are the south of the center. Um, and so our kids are very similar uh, to, to, to those in the slums. These are the treated children. So what we do is we fill one third of the gap between the, the poorest kids and the, and, the, um, and the middle class. So big, small, that's what we get. Now we got it this with uh, $300 per year per child. The Colombian government is currently running programs for these children that cost $1,300 per year per child. Uh, and we did it in a way which is potentially scalable. Now, the big question is whether these impacts are going to be sustained over time, uh, which we don't know. But that's what we, this is how, ha what happens over the distribution. So these are the treatment and control. So there is a, not, the impact is not concentrated on certain kids. It's the, we pretty much shift the entire distribution to the, to, to the right. And these are, uh, you know, impacts on, on, other, on other things. As I mentioned, there were three arms. So there is a stimulation, there is a nutrition, and a combination. 
the big disappointment, the stimulate the nutrition is the latest fad in in uh, in these things is micronutrients. So, so these are little sachets that contain um, iron, zinc, um, folic acid, vitamin A, and vitamin C. You put them on food, they disappear. They don't taste. They don't smell. So they're supposed to have very good absorption uh, properties. And we were convinced to get an impact with the nutrition. You know, at baseline, 41% of our kids were anemic. So we said, we, okay, we'll give them iron, it's gonna work. Well, we had zero impact of, uh, of, uh, of the nutrition. And given the pain that this, in, this intervention costed us, uh, um, need to, you know, we, we had to import this stuff into Bogota. We bought it in India because that's the cheapest place to buy this uh, micronutrient, and then we had to import this uh, white powder into Colombia. So you can, uh, can tell, I can tell you a few anecdotes about, about that experience. Um, and no impact whatsoever. But the stimulation, uh, both uh, on its own and, com and combined with the nutrition, uh, it did have an impact. So then, then what we do is to, do, uh, to estimate the model I showed you before. Uh, and, and, and that's what we're doing in a paper, which is almost ready. It uh, should be on my web page in a few weeks. And w the reason we want to know how this, this thing worked. Now, if you frame this problem, the intervention within, within that uh, framework, there are one of two ways in which you can have an impact, or a combination of both. One is that you change the parameters of the produ production function. You make, you make this kid, uh, these parents more productive. So when, when you get that parameter on investment, it becomes bigger. Alternatively, you're not doing anything to the production function, but somehow you induce parents to invest more. So you increase the input. And now with that framework, we can test this, hypo this different hypothesis and different explanation uh, about uh, how the intervention works. And that's what we did. So we first, the first step is to estimate the investment function and here I can show all my skills in Beamer. I can make uh, the, uh, the um, indexes of, the, of these things uh, with a different color. So that's what the, the, the blue things is the stuff that can be affected by the intervention. So we let the, all the parameters of the investment function to be, uh, to be a function of the intervention. Um, and second, uh, we, uh, uh, we do the, the estimation. And here, again, we can change all the parameters so that we get the CES uh, production function. And we actually tried more, even more flexible specifications. And the CES is a pretty good approximation. Um, but we can also change the red stuff. So by changing the investment function as a consequence of the intervention, uh, the, uh, the investment both in uh, materials and in time can, can, can move. Um, so what do we do? Uh, we estimate all this uh, uh, with the large set of measures we have. Um, and so, first of all, we want to test, do a reality test on our algorithms. So we estimate the joint distribution of these uh, this, uh, um, non-observable factors, and uh, uh, both a, a baseline and follow-up. And sure enough, in the cognitive skill, uh, for the cognitive factor, we do observe a shift to the right. So this is just a confirmation that our machinery is working as it's supposed to do. But what we do observe, the other thing, the big thing that we observe, there is a big shift to the right of the, um, uh, of, uh, the distribution of the investment factor, both for material and time. So these parents are spending more time and they're, spending, uh, and they're buying more toys, more play material, more books for their children. Now, I apologize for these uh, tables. They are too small, and these are the investment functions, so let me skip them. Um, but the one thing that I, I zoom in is the uh, effect of the treatment on the investment function. So you, there is a, a, a shift in the intercept, which is very significant, which is you know, the translation into numbers of that shift to the right of the distribution I just showed you. And that's the, one, the same for, uh, for investment, uh, for time. Now, when I go to the production function, this is the production function for uh, cognitive skills, there are a number of really interesting facts. First of all, actually, you cannot reject Cobb Douglas. So the elasticity of substitution is pretty much one. And it is quite precisely estimated one, first. Second, we do it twice. First, ignoring the endogeneity of investment 
and then allowing for endogeneity of investment with this control function approach. If you look at the coefficient on, uh, on say, material investment, it goes from 0.056 to 0.277. So the, 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 um, um, once you take into account the endogeneity, the coefficient on investment goes up, which is a, an indication that parents are, are compensating. And that's not obvious. I mean, if you go to the literature, you find papers that say the parents are ac accentuating uh, the impacts of shocks. Here we have pretty strong evidence they are compensating. The third thing that for, for cognition, what matters is, um, is material investment, while for uh, non-cognitive skills is time investment that matters, while cognition is just not significantly different from zero. Finally, the last thing that, uh, that uh, we find both for both the cognitive and non-cognitive is that if we uh, look at the effect of the, of the intervention on, on total factor productivity, or indeed it's not in the stable, but we can test on each single parameter, there is no effect whatsoever. So the intervention is not making this, it's not increasing the total factor productivity of the CS production function. It's not making these parents more uh, productive, but it, it's inducing the parents to, to invest more. So that's, uh, that's what we've done. Now let me, let me say a few things about uh, the use of, uh, of, uh, of structural models versus uh, RCTs. <clears throat> So I started my example on the Colombian intervention by just uh, showing you the, uh, the, the impact, which was obtained from a cluster randomized control, control trial. Those are nice because they are very simple to explain to anybody, even a politician could understand it. And, uh, and uh, they are robust uh, uh, and, and, and they're, they're very strong evidence. So what's the use of a structural model? Well, as I try to stress in this particular case, a structural model can help you to understand the mechanisms uh, through which an intervention works, and that can be a very useful for, uh, for policy design. The structure we, think, uh, we build uh, is a very useful way to synthesize lots of information. It gives you lots of discipline you know, the, 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 the explicitly writing down this factor structure, you have all these measures, you have all the scales of the Baileys, you have the MacArthur test on language, you can pile on and on and on. And, and although now people are being a bit more disciplined in uh, not to do too much data mining and using these this, um, uh, corrections for multiple hypothesis testing, I think it's good to start from the very beginning. We think, we think that there is a cognitive factor, maybe a social emotional factor, maybe a health factor. Okay, and we have lots of imprecise measures of that. Let's, let's put them explicitly uh, side by side, the theoretical framework and the measurement uh, system. And I think that's, um, that's very useful. Now notice that we do not use the RCT to identify investment. So when I present my paper on the production function in places like Cambridge, Massachusetts, I always got asked, oh, you, got, you run a randomized controlled trial, why don't you estimate, why don't you use to identify the investment function? Well, the reason why I don't, I resist that is because I use the uh, randomized controlled trial uh, to see whether it shifts investment or not, or to see whether it shifts the, the parameters of the production function. If I allow the investment to enter the production function, maybe because it, it, it improves the efficiency, then it's not a valid instrument for the investment anymore. Um, and so exposed, it turned out that it didn't, so I could have, but, uh, but ex ante, uh, I cannot do that. And therefore, I need to use different sources of variation to identify the, uh, the role that the investment plays in the production function of skills. And that's why we use prices and, and the like. <clears throat> measurement. So, so measurement is certainly central and appropriate measure can be used to solve identification problems. I told you that the model is identified under the assumption that you have at least two independent measures of the same factor. Now you can construct that. You can make sure that the, your assumptions are satisfied. For instance, in the case of cognitive development, we have the Bailey's test, which are done observing the child performing a number of tasks by a psychologist. Then we have the MacArthur uh, language scales, which are uh, collected by an interview, a different interviewer interviewing the mother. 
So assuming the measurement error between a, a, a measure compiled by a psychologist on a day on the child and another measure done on a different day by a different person on the mother, it's not too bad as an assumption. More generally, I think the theory should talk to the to 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 date to measurement, and you should uh, build up um, uh, appropriate measures to uh, uh, to do that. The, uh, the other thing that I think is uh, there is lots to be done in terms of constructing new measures, and I think we should try to go beyond the refill preferences. Now, I've been doing some work uh, uh, following on Mansky on using subjective expectations. I've been having a really hard time publishing some of these papers. There is a very strong resistance on the part of economists to use data that, come out, that don't come out from revealed preferences, from choices that people make uh, buying stuff or, or, or going to work or, or whatever. And I think uh, you can go back to the 60s, to the big debates that were at the time, and there is some reasons beyond that, but I think they're not very good reasons. There, there is evidence that this evidence can, that these measures can be used in a profitable way. So on the necessity to improve measurements in cognitive development, as I mentioned, the Bailey scales uh, is supposed, uh, we used it, and it's supposed to be the gold standard in this, uh, but it's bloody expensive. Uh, to us, it cost us, um, it costed um, $150 per child to do a Bailey test. The Bailey test has to be done by a specialized psychologist, which is trained for six weeks. A Pearson, who is the publisher, will not allow you to operate those tests unless a, a qualified uh, psychologist does it. And you have to do it, you cannot do it in the home of the, of the child, you have to take the child somewhere, and it lasts for an hour and a half. So this is very, very expensive. If you want to do it in countries like Africa, forget it. So what people do uh, is to go around uh, doing alternative things. Unfortunately, many of these things are very, very noisy. So we've done uh, another study in Bogota where we took kids uh, and we did the Bailey. And then the following week, we do uh, different tests that people use very widely in the, in the profession. And then we can compute the correlation between the, the gold standard measures and, and, and these alternative measures. There are th things like the uh, ages and stages questionnaire, which the World Bank pro uh, um, promotes and lots of people do. Uh, the Denver test, the Battelle test, and others. Now, the red are the ages and stages. Look, this is the correlation with the Bailey. For kids below the age of uh, uh, 18 months, the correlation is 0.1, not statistically different from zero. So we are collecting noise effectively. Um, it goes up to 0.3 by the time the kid is uh, 31 months. So this is very depressing. But this also tells me that there is lots of work to be done. And, and, and it's a little bit better with language. So language, especially if you look at expressive language, you can get correlation. The, Macar the MacArthur um, language inventory test is, is very easy to implement. It takes 10 minutes and you can get uh, 0.6 with the, with, uh, with the Baileys. So that's a good test. But there's you know, lots of work to be done. There are um, lots of really exciting stuff that now is using electronics. So eye tracking technology. Uh, you can give some really simple tasks to the kids and then film the, 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 where the child is looking and, and, and get. And Fernanda Stanford has been doing some really interesting work. Uh, there is something called functional near infrared spectroscopy which is basically portable uh, uh, fMRI, which is pretty amazing. Uh, so this, these women at uh, UCL and, um, and Birbeck, they've done it. They published just a paper in uh, Nature where they do this stuff in, in, in the Gambia, so in fairly remote places. So there, there's low, uh, probably some low-hanging fruits to be, uh, to be uh, got there. And I already told about, uh, told about uh, the stuff of repeated measures, and so, so let me skip that. <clears throat> so another dimension in which tool, measurement tools can be developed is uh, listing individual responses to, uh, uh, on tastes, preferences, attitudes, expectations, and beliefs. And, and this approach requires often to go beyond revealed preferences. Uh, and in addition to choices, uh, we can write questionnaires that, that can elicit um, other dimension, often based on hypotheticals. And as I said, this is, uh, 
is, uh, there's been some pioneering work that goes back to Tom Jaster in the 60s um, and other researchers in Michigan. Chuck Mansky has been doing quite a bit of work on, on subjective expectations. So I've been doing some work with Flavio Cunha. <coughs> uh, and this is, uh, Flavio works uh, in, on a hospital in uh, Philadelphia with um, uh, fir uh, fir first time mothers uh, that are pregnant <coughs> and uses tablets like iPads to elicit um, uh, beliefs about uh, investment uh, in, in children. We also use tablets in Colombia, but this kind of tablets. And so uh, here, what we basically have is uh, each, each little uh, bead represents um, uh, a scenario. So we tell, okay, and we vary scenarios in terms of investment and, um, and um, initial conditions. And the outcome when we look at are simple outcomes which are language typically. <clears throat> so we say suppose the child of a certain age can say these words and the mother spends so many hours and then uh, uh, when do you think this child is going to say these other words? And these words that we choose, we have used the factor analysis to, to identify within the MacArthur uh, language inventory tests uh, words that are particularly salient, that have a high um, uh, factor loadings and therefore they're, they're salient in terms of the, the development of the child. And then, you know, this is a mother doing the test. So she, uh, she moves on the bead and, you know, and we give them the possibility of revising and, and uh, we just got this data a couple of months ago and so now we're, we're, we're starting to, uh, to, to look at them. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, now if you don't, uh, so the role of beliefs, why am I doing this? Because I think beliefs are important. So as we said um, in the Colombian things, we didn't change the, we didn't make these parents more effective or more efficient. What we did was we changed their uh, investment. But why did we change their investment? So we must have changed their perception of the returns to that investment. At least that's the only explanation I can think of. Um, and so, that's, that's what I'm saying. So it's possible that they were not aware of the productivity of the investment. And so in the model that we saw before, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the parents' investment depends on their taste and their perception of the production function. Now I'm doing a paper with Sarah Catton at IFS. Suppose that we don't, we don't elicit these beliefs as we're doing with Flavio. And suppose, however, that um, we assume that parents are maximizing utility and they do their investment choices and, and their choices depends on perceived uh, production function. Now suppose that uh, the utility is the sum of two power functions. This is just an example. You can do it much more uh, general, but it's an easy way to do it. So that's the uh, utility function. That's the budget constraint. This is the true production function, the green one. The red one is what parents believe the production function is. So then you can do some algebra and you can get uh, first of the condition and you can uh, take log and derive an investment function. Now these choices are not necessarily optimal. They are only optimal if what the parents believe the production function is coincides with the true production function. Now, how can we identify these distorted beliefs? So one, I, one possibility is just to ask people. That's what we've been doing uh, with those little beads. Alternatively, we can use interventions where information provision is successful, like, uh, like the one in Colombia, to identify the distorted parameters. What's the idea? Suppose that I'm willing to make the assumption that what the intervention did was to reveal the true production function of the parents, and that's why they're investing more now. So I can use the treated parents to identify tastes and, and, the, and the true production function. Then I can take the choices made up by the control parents. Now these guys are making their investment choices because the, the intervention is randomly assigned, the taste of those parents have to be the same as the taste of the treated parents. So I can, I can take the taste parameters from the treated parents can plug them in into the production and the investment function and that investment choices of the control parents will identify the distorted beliefs. So that's the idea we are pursuing. 
So I get some, I, uh, and so here the RCT is very useful because it allows us to assume that the uh, taste parameters of the treated and controlled parents are the same. Uh, and so that's the algebra behind this, this reasoning. So I will not uh, dwell on that uh, too much. And this can be estimated quite easily by, by OLS, really. It's, it's, not, it's not big um, econometrics going on here. And that's what, uh, you know, the, the, the ratio of the investment parameters of the treatment and control will give you, uh, can identify the, the, production, the distorted production function. Um, so these are some additional technical points. So you, can, you don't need to use just the treatment you can, for the investment. You can do, use them both to estimate the production function. And so there are some, some additional issues. So that's what we get. And so this is the ratio. The, the beta is the productivity of, uh, of parental investment. And the beta tilde is the distorted one. The beta is the true one. And so we identify the ratio. And what we are saying is that the, the, the control parents underestimate the productivity of the investment. That's why they were, they were investing less. And so that's, uh, that's what uh, we get. And this is uh, consistent with anecdotal evidence. Uh, poor parents tend to overestimate the importance of initial conditions and they underestimate the importance of investment, um, especially for normal children. There is, um, I mentioned earlier this book by Annette Leroux, Unequal Childhoods. So she's an anthropologist, so her, her, her sample is uh, 12. And there are 12 chapters in the book. So each, uh, each, uh, each chapter is a child. But it's really fascinating, it's really interesting uh, stuff because she goes and lives with these kids and, uh, and the six are from poor families and six from middle class families. And one thing, she has this construct of um, concertated cultivation, which is what the middle class parents do. They take the children to play soccer and play the violin and drama classes and, and so on and so forth. And then there is the, the poor parents and the, the working class parents that do what she calls promotion of na natural growth. The attitude is, the kid is gonna be fine. Just let him play, it's gonna be fine. We're watching TV. We're playing around outside, whatever. Um, and, and, and the only occasion in which these parents think that something important, uh, the intervention is important, if the child runs into trouble. Then, what, then the re remedial stuff is necessary. And I've talked to lots of parents, in, 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 especially in Colombia. Uh, in Indi we are doing this stuff in India. In Indi I don't speak the languages there, so it's harder. But, uh, but you see this attitude all the time. So they say, oh, the child is going to be fine. Why do I need to spend time with him? And unless they have a problematic child, then they say, oh, what should I do with, with her? Um, so it, it resonates. And these results seem to be consistent with that. So let me conclude. Uh, the study of human capital accumulation, I think, is important, especially in the context of developing countries. We know much. We have learned much. Um, and these are some of the things we learned. <clears throat> but I think there is still much we do not know. We do not know lots of the details of the production function of human capital, the role of nutrition, the genetics and epigenetics, the complementarities. We do not know really how parents operate. And, and we do not know how to build scalable interventions. <clears throat> So this is a research agenda for the future, better measurement tools, use of structural models to identify the production function and parental behavior. That's key to construct the policy interventions. And then uh, uh, all this should, should lead to better and more effective policies. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, Professor Atanasio. Now the floor is open for questions. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask, is there any sense that uh, once they have, so once the parents have found out this better production function, that this transfers perhaps through neighboring families that learn by example or some you know, relatives, something like that? 
Yeah, no, that, that's a very interesting question and something we've been thinking a lot about. Unfortunately, uh, we, I cannot give you an answer on the basis of what we have done simply because we do not have the data. And not because we haven't uh, thought about collecting those data, it's just that we didn't have the money to do it. You know, the, the data collection is very expensive. And uh, we always, uh, I've been spending the last uh, eight years going around asking people for money. By the way, this is a bank, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, to do this research, and um, and we're always constrained by that. I mean, the, just to give you an idea of the order of magnitude, the the, the study we done in Colombia, uh, including the running of the intervention and the um, and the uh, measurements, the two surveys at the beginning and at the end, uh, for those 96 towns, and uh, cost a um, million and a half dollars. Uh, we're doing something in India which is even bigger than this. Uh, we have a budget of about two million, two and a half million dollars. So, and, and, and we're really stretched on, on what we can do and what we can't do. We're talking about your difficulties about eliciting beliefs and convincing your colleagues um, that this is meaningful. Maybe you can look, uh, talk to experimental economists. Uh, in my early days, um, for us it was also difficult to um, do this and especially to ask for comments, written comments. Yeah. So you, either you have to wait or you have to ask what tricks do we use to convince our colleagues um, that this is meaningful. No, I, I have lots of sympathy for that. And fortunately, I, I do have colleagues that do that stuff. And I was, I, I've been doing it myself at some level in some situations and trying to actually use games as, um, <clears throat> as, a, as a measurement device. Um, the, the one thing that my impression is that the games are great uh, to measure certain things, especially when you're thinking about interactions. They're also very, very delicate uh, measurement tools. In the sense that you can, it's very easy to get um, to, mess, to to get noise there. I mean, the same is true for questionnaires. Uh, but uh, but I was impressed by how how um, sensitive behavior in games is to uh, very minor con con um, uh, environmental changes. So we, the first time I did it was this this. Uh, um, VCM game, this public good game in, in Colombia, we ran a bunch of uh, sessions and we had the, exactly the same script and we had three research assistants, two girls and a boy. The boy has a big impact on, on social capital. <laughs> so if the script is read by the boy, they are much more cooperative. So it's, it's, very, it's very useful, it's also very delicate. But again, this is true for any questionnaire. Uh, that you write, you know the stuff that people were doing in the in the sixties to try to measure financial wealth by households. There are lots of those problems still. So I'm very sympathetic. Um, so you were saying that uh, it was a relatively large scale operation in Colombia, and you said that your costs were only a fraction of the government programs. And has there been any response or interest by the local government? Um, so over the years, I've grown uh, uh, very cynical about the response of uh, uh, politicians to uh, evidence. Um, the, the short answer in the case of Colombia is no. They, we show them this stuff extensively, but they haven't done much with it. On the positive side, uh, the, our work has been taken up by the Peruvian government. So the, Peru, the, the Peruvians are actually scaling up this all over Peru. And we are doing some work with them on trying to evaluate it at the same time. So you lose some, you win some. Yes, a related question. Uh, you have mentioned the cost. Have you estimated the, the gains from the intervention, the present discounted value of? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, and uh, not because I don't want to. Uh, it's very, very hard. Uh, if you let me, if you are willing to wait for 25 years, I can give you an answer. But I need to follow these kids. I don't know how these gains will translate into academic success. I don't know how that academic success will translate in Colombia. 
uh, into um, uh, earnings. Well, at least give me another five years until they go to school. So then, then, then you can maybe extrapolate from other studies than math. But that's the difficulty, right? And that is uh, talking about earnings. Uh, from Perry Preschool Program, for since we know the big impact is on crime behavior. And, and so that, that, uh, that uh, probably cause uh, gains that you need to factor in. So uh, we haven't done it, but it could be done uh, with some heroic assumptions. <coughs> So, Razio, sorry, a quick question for me. So, you showed these um, uh, graphs where you showed that the Baileys is uh, only weakly correlated with some of the cheap measures of cognition. Yeah. Uh, maybe you said it, but I missed it. But do we also know that Baileys is much better than those cheap measures at predicting things that we, we care about? <coughs> Uh, the Baileys have been uh, uh, validated a fair amount in terms of their predictive power <coughs> of, oh, say, academic success at later ages. So, yes. So, yes yeah. <coughs> and, uh, and you can, you know, I've, I've watched uh, quite a few of these games. And after you spend a couple of days watching the Baileys and watching the a ASQ, you know why the Baileys is better. I mean, the, the Baileys is... Uh, is a sequence of tasks that you give to the child, and and so they become co more and more complex. And then you stop when the child uh, makes five con uh, consecutive consecutive errors. In the case of the ASQ, you ask um, a mother, which is of might be literate or very low uh, educational uh, outcomes, and you ask, "Oh, does your child do this?" And, and it's not clear they understand what you're asking. It's not clear what their motivation to answer is and, and all that. As I said, if you try to measure language, that's e this is a bit easier, especially if you, if you do expressive language. Because if you ask a mother, does your child say dog, she will know whether the child says that word. Already, if you do receptive language, does your ch child understand heteroscedasticity? <laughs> <laughs> It's not clear, she, she will know that. Well, I have a, another question, and I'm, the thing is I was wondering what, if you can just share with us your intuition about what the results would have been with regard to importance of stimulation, those figures for stimulation, if applied to developed countries. And I'm saying that taking into account this tendency of the developed world to perhaps overstimulate children, I don't know if, what, what are your... Um, so, so personal, I, 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 okay, uh, no, that's a very interesting question. Uh, two things, I think uh, in the developed world, and there was the, the evidence on this woman, uh, Annette Leroux, is from the US. Um, so the lack of stimulation, um, uh, exists in developed countries for the uh, low socioeconomic background uh, status. I mean, the, the other evidence which is incredible is this book by these two sociologists. Uh, it's called the um, it's called the Meaningful Differences. It's the number of words to which um, um, low socioeconomic background children are exposed to. And it's an order of magnitude smaller than, than the other children. Now, whether uh, middle class children are overstimulated, over programmed, or over. It's probably true. I do not, but that's my, that's not a scientific opinion. It's, I, you know, it's, um, it could be true. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, incidentally, one place where we are planning to do uh, uh, SALIS, implement SALIS curriculum and, um, and do this uh, program is St. Peterborough in the UK, uh, which is one of the most uh, deprived areas in, in the UK. And we are working with the social, ca uh, with the council, the social services uh, of uh, Peterborough Council to, to do something like that. In, the, in, the, uh, in developed countries, there is a really interesting um, ideas about how to finance these things with um, these things, social impact bonds. So the idea is that if you think that this is, uh, has got uh, returns, uh, then you can uh, try to convince private investors to put money into it. And the way you pay it, so the, for instance, uh, in Peterborough we'll say, 
let's take this cohort of children age two. We know that uh, in, this, uh, in these neighborhoods, 50% by the age six will be in special education needs, which should cost uh, you know, 20,000 pounds per child per year in the UK. And they will be, uh, they will be in special education need uh, for um, 12 years. Now, suppose that they do an intervention in early years that reduces this uh, SEN from 50 to 25%. So I have it. Uh, you guys are going to save lots of money. Now, we write an agreement uh, according to which if you save this money, you give me half of it, and I'll use it to pay the investors. Uh, and uh, Goldman Sachs in the U.S. has put some money for a, a similar program in um, Utah, and they're doing it. It's, I think these are interesting, exciting ideas. <coughs> If there are no more questions, then thank you very much, Professor Atanasio. And ladies and gentlemen, now we have to well, thank you for your attendance and participating in the discussion. And please uh, just join us for a glass of cava next door in the, at the foyer. Thank you. Thank you.